Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh and welcome to our live session as part of Ramadan Connect in collaboration with the Islamic Curriculum Initiative. We have our special presenter today, Brother Mohammed uh, Vahed, joining us from South Africa. And we also have Sister Zainab Elp joining us from Turkey, mashallah, as part of the ICI. So before we begin, I'd just like to present our uh, facilitator today. Uh, before I do that, though, I'll open with Bismillah Rahmani Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam. And again, for those just joining, welcome to Isla's Ramadan Connect 1445. So today in our live session, which will be on the olive trees of Palestine, we have advocate brother Mohammed Abdullah Vahed joining us from South Africa. He has over 30 years of legal experience. He's also been an executive at Al Baraka Bank. He has authored many books and is the founder of the Young Leaders Academy. The objective of the Young Leaders Academy is to train future leaders. He works extensively with schools, universities, Dara Looms, Ulema, and corporates. MashaAllah. Wonderful to have you with us today, Brother Muhammad. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be on uh, this program. Alhamdulillah. So before we get into the lesson, I'll just share a few words about ISLA. ISLA stands for the Islamic Schools League of America. It's made up of over 300 full-time Islamic schools, which amounts to over 50,000 Muslim students nationwide in the U.S. And the listserv um, connects 1,000 education professionals, which now are also an international network. We provide a comprehensive database of Islamic schools, and we help map out the landscape of Islamic schooling in the U.S., gauging progress in areas of need. So we're very honored to be uh, hosting again Ramadan Connect in partnership with the Islamic Curriculum Initiative, which grew out of the Global Association of Islamic Schools. And we will now get on with our live lesson here. Welcome to all the students and teachers joining us. This will be recorded and the slide deck will also be made available, inshallah, for all of those that are interested. Okay, Bismillah. Over to you, Brother Muhammad. Jazakallah khair. Uh, we begin in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, Master of the Day of Judgment. He do we worship, and He do we ask for help, and we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to share His, to shower His choicest blessings on the greatest of His creations, on the seal of all prophets, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and to his family and to his companions. Amen. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, how are you, my dear students? Can you see me? Just wave to me so I know that we you can hear me. Jazakallah uh, khair. This is going to be a very interactive session. We're going to have lots of discussions, lots of questions and answers. So I'd like to hear your voices as well. So as Brother Yahya has mentioned, my name is Mohammed Vahid, and I am from South Africa. Do you know where South Africa is? You do? Where is it? Anyone? Okay, I see a hand up in 4A. Go ahead, whoever's standing at the front there. Go ahead. It's in Africa. Africa, yes. And which part of Africa, Asma? South Africa. Correct, right at the bottom. So you have a look in this map here. You can see Africa and South Africa is at the bottom southernmost tip of Africa. And then there is a place called Durban, and that is where I am uh, situated. It's a coastal town. And from here to Masjid Aqsa, you'll see on the next uh, line, it'll show you how many kilometers or miles away, Brother Yahya. So the distance between Durban and Masjid Aqsa is nine thousand five hundred kilometers or almost six thousand miles it's long distance but the south africans have got a very deep and close attachment to the brothers and sisters of palestine okay let's move on 
Now, South Africa is world famous for two very important people. Do you know who those people are? Anyone? Two very famous people. No? Okay, I'll show you the photograph of the first person. Have you seen him before? Anyone? I see no? A few, a few hands up there. A few hands. Okay, what's his name? Anyone? Maybe 5A, I saw a hand up. Anyone want to answer there? Or 5B? Okay. Anyone wants to venture? Oh, there we go. Yes, go ahead, my girl. Oh. No, feeling shy? Okay. Okay, let's give you the name. Okay, it's Sheikh Ahmed Didat. You people must have heard of him. Very, very famous scholar. He is late now. And he he was an exceptionally good uh, researcher on the Christian Bible. And he used to have many, many debates internationally with uh, other Christian scholars. And on the next picture, can you, I'm sure you will know the person on the right who is standing there with Ahmed Didat. He is very, very famous. And we'll give you his name. He is none other than Dr. Zakir Naik. And he was mentored by Brother Ahmed Sheikh, uh, Ahmed Didat. Now, the second very famous person that you see in this photograph, who is he? I can see some hands up there in 4A. Yes, who is he? Um, the president. Hmm. President, what's his name? What's his name? Um, <laughs> okay, his his name is uh, Nelson Mandela, and he was yes he was the first president of South Africa after the end of apartheid. So that gives you some idea of South Africa, some idea of where I am situated and what has made South Africa famous. Another thing that has made South Africa very very Famous is the fact that South Africa has gone to the International Court of Justice and took the case there against uh, the occupiers in Palestine for what they are doing to our Palestinian brothers and sisters. Okay, let's move on to the lesson itself. So in this lesson, we'll be discussing the following, the olive trees and their uses, the harvesting of the olives, and I'll take you into a factory where the olive oil is made. And then we'll discuss also the challenges faced by the farmers, uh, the destruction of their trees, the theft of their olives, etc. So just to give you an idea, we've got a fantastic uh, lesson lined up for you. So raise your hands if you have tried olive oil before, you've used olive oil. Great. And some of the things that we use olive oil for, you will know you use it in salads, you use it uh, for cooking, your mothers will use it for cooking, etc. So all of us have had some experience uh, and use of olive. Now to really appreciate the importance of the olive tree to the Palestinians, we need to know a little about Palestinian history. So very quickly, I'll give you a brief history of Palestine, and then you'll see why the Palestinians hold so dearly to the Palest to the olive trees. So let's move into the history part of it very quickly. Now, before 1917, 1917 is a very important date because 1917 was the time of the First World War. At that time, just before 1917, Palestine was controlled by the Ottomans. And you know the Ottomans, they are the Turks. And then the Turks, the Ottomans, they were on the losing side in the First World War, and after they lost the war, Britain, Great Britain, gained control of Palestine. Thereafter, the Zionists, the people who are currently occupying Palestine, they wanted a homeland. So they asked the British, we want the homeland, but that homeland must be in Palestine. Why in Palestine? Because they believed that their ancestors lived in Palestine. So the British then agreed. 
And thereafter, what happened is that lots and lots of Jews moved to Palestine. In 1917, almost the entire Palestine was populated by Palestinians only. Very small number of Jews lived in Palestine. But after 1917, more and more Jews started immigrating to Palestine. Now, when they began immigrating to Palestine, they wanted more and more land. So what they did was they started causing trouble for the Palestinians. They started shooting them. They started killing them. And even when the British wanted them to stop what they were doing, they even attacked the British. Okay, let's move on. So the British got tired of the Jewish problem. They said, we cannot handle these people anymore. So they handed over the Jewish problem to the United Nations. Now, you people must have heard of the United Nations. Now, another very significant date is 1948. That was World War II. So after World War II, what United Nations did, it said, okay, let's divide Palestine into two. We'll give 56% of Palestine to the Jews and 44% of Palestine to the local Palestinians. Now, was that fair, children? Was that fair to give away the land of the Palestinians to foreigners? Yes or no? It wasn't fair. So the Palestinians who were living there in Palestine then had to move out and make place for the Jews. But even then, the Zionists were not happy. They wanted more and more land. And they continued attacking the Palestinians and they destroyed 500 villages. And up to 800,000 Palestinians were forced to leave their homes. So you can see the picture on the left hand side. These are the Palestinians who were forced to leave. And this is what's known as Nakba or the catastrophe. So this is just a little background to Palestine. And up to this day, the Palestinians are being persecuted. And the Zionists want more and more of Palestinian land. Okay. Uh, Brother Muhammad, there is a question from 4A yes. here before we move on. Yes. Go ahead and unmute um, 4A. Okay. Yeah, I say salam alaikum first one. Wa alaikum salam. I have a question. Why did they choose Palestine? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't hear that. What was it, Yahya? Yeah. Say it Why again. Why did Palestine? Why did they choose this area in Palestine? Ah, okay. Why they chose Palestine? That's a very good question, my girl. Okay, because the Jews believed that their ancestors resided, they lived in Palestine, and therefore they wanted to go back to Palestine. But that's not really true. Because while some Jews lived in Palestine, long before they even moved to Palestine, there were local Palestinians living there. So the original people of Palestine were the indigenous, the native Palestinians. However, the Jews wanted a homeland. They were, they were kicked out. They were thrown out of many, many countries in which they lived. So they did not have their own homeland. So when they sat down to decide where should we move to, they decided among themselves, the leaders of the Jews, that we must move to Palestine because that is where our ancestors came from. So that is the reason, my girl. That's a very good question. Thank you. So where are the Palestinians today? Now you'll notice there are six million Palestinian refugees. Refugee is a person who's moved out of his or her house. And then you can see on the left-hand side of this map where Palestine is, you can see Gaza, the small green patch on the left-hand corner. So many Palestinians are staying there. They had to emigrate there from the rest of uh, Palestine. And then you've got the West Bank. So that is where the majority of Palestinians are living in Palestine. But many of them, millions of them are living outside Palestine. They're living in Syria. They're living in Jordan. They're living in Lebanon and other countries, okay? Now, in the next slide, you would have seen the shrinking map of Palestine. And this is the 
What you see in the extreme left-hand corner, that is what Palestine looked like in 1917. Green, it was occupied almost predominantly by Palestinians. And then in 1947, when it was divided, so you can see the green portions, that is what was given to the Palestinians and the white portions was given to the Jews. So it was 56 and 44%. And then there was a very important war that took place in 1967. And arising out of the war, the Jews then, the Zionists took a larger chunk of Palestine from the Palestinians. That's the third picture that you can see there. And the fourth picture, the one on the extreme right, today the Palestinians have only about 15, 1.5% of their land left. The rest of it has been stolen by the Zionists. Okay, so that's the background, that's the history. And now we're going into our lesson on the olive tree. Now, olives are a truly amazing and blessed fruit. Now, did you know that they are mentioned as many as seven times in the Holy Quran? Our Holy Prophet وسلم, encouraged us to use olive and its oils. And olives also have great nutritional as well as cosmetic benefits. Now, out of the seven verses, one of that, one of them you are very familiar with, and that is the verse Watine was Zaytun. So this is what the verse says. On the next slide. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Watine was Zaytun, Waturi Sinin, Wahazal Baladil Amin. And the translation of this is by the fig and the olive, by the Mount Sinai, and by this city, that city of Mecca, a heaven of peace, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath on all these things. And then he says something to this effect that I have created you in the best of forms. So out of the seven places where olives and olive trees are mentioned in the Quran, this is just one of them that I'm sharing with you. Okay, let's move on to what the Prophet ﷺ had to say about olives. There's two sayings of his. The first one is, eat the oil of olives and use it on your hair and skin, for it comes from a blessed tree. How many of you use it on your hair or on your skin? Raise your hands, please. Oh, great. Wonderful. So you are actually carrying out a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So what you need to do the next time you use, even if you are eating it, even if you are using it on your skin or your hair, tell yourself, this is a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that I am carrying out. And if you make that intention, then this daily thing that you're doing, you'll get rewarded for it. You'll do that, inshallah. Great. And the second hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. It's reported, the Prophet Sallallahu is reported to have said, take oil of olive and massage it with it. It is a blessed tree. So we also need, it, need to massage it for people who are not well. Okay, let's move on now. So that is something about the importance of olives and olive trees in the Quran and the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Now I want you to pay careful attention to this video that I'm going to be showing you. It's about olives olive tree, the harvesting of olives, the importance of olives in the Palestinian economy, what they do with the olives, how olives are made into olive oil. And eventually the lady will tell us a little about the trouble that they have with the settlers who want to steal the olives and damage the olive plantations. So let's sit back and relax and enjoy this video. This is freshly pressed olive oil. And in Palestine, this stuff is basically liquid gold. Not only is Palestinian olive oil rich in flavor, it's also extremely financially valuable. It's an intrinsic part of Palestinian culture and heritage. And for many Palestinians, olive oil is so much more than just something delicious to eat. Every year after the first rainfall of the autumn season, Palestinians set out from their homes and head to their olive groves which are sprawled across the rolling hills of Palestine and cover the land of the West Bank in beautiful shades of green.
The scene behind me is one that's being played across all of Palestine right now as Palestinians gather together for the olive harvest, which happens every year in the month of October. Many of these olive trees are decades old and have been passed down within these families by each generation. For Palestinians, the olive harvest isn't just about picking olives. It's symbolic of their culture, their tradition, and the Palestinian ties to this land. يعني أبوي ورثنا عن أبو وإحنا ما زلنا باللكتين برضو نعم عمرهم أكثر من خمسين سنة أكثر من خمسين سنة اللي زي هذول الصغار اللي كبير أكبر من ذلك في العمر يعني وإحنا أولاد صغار كنا يعني ما نعرفش اللكت زتون كنا نيجي باعتبار زي يعني شمة هواء أو رحلة نزهن اعتبرها الإنسان بيكبر وبيجوا أولاد ودور بكرة أولادنا بيكبروا بصير أولادهم يجوا تت يعني خلينا نقول ميراث يتناقله الأجيال هذه طبيعة يعني هذه طبيعة الحال بالنسبة للأجيال الزيتون زيتون شيء اساسي في حياتنا مم. يعني مش شيء عفوي شيء شيء متعمق فينا موسم الزيتون الزيت معروف عندنا يعني مثل في العاميه بقول الزيت عماده البيت فالبيت اللي بيكون فيه زيت خلاص اهله ما بيخافوا من شيء يعني لانه بيعتبروا طعام اساسي غير الشك المادي شك معنوي خلاص يعني شجره الزيتون لها معزه خاصه في قلوب في قلوب الناس هون بشكل عام الجميع بيحبها اي نعم خلاص يعني هذه شجرة مباركة موجودة في بلادنا من مئات السنين أو من آلاف السنين اللي بيقدروا نقول فإلها معزة خاصة في قلوب الجميع سبحان الله. We've been here for a few hours now and now it's time to take a break. The family has cooked this amazing meal just over a fire in the middle of their olive grove. And this is what we mean when we say that for Palestinians the olive harvest is more than about just picking the olives off the trees around them. It's about family, it's about gathering together and enjoying the fruits of their labor. On the breakfast table this morning is freshly picked olives from last year's harvest. And the olives that they pick today will be on their table for the rest of the year. After every olive is plucked from its tree, Palestinian families collect their harvest into bags and transport them to the nearest olive oil factory, where dozens of machines sift, wash, grind, and press the olives until they turn into a thick golden oil. Once the olive oil is poured into large plastic tanks, some families will go on to sell their oil across Palestine for hundreds of dollars, while others will take just enough for themselves and give the rest to friends, family, and neighbors. شوف أنا زي ما حكيت قبل إنه أبوي وأمي حتى خواتي الكبار يساعدوا أهلي في زراعة الزيتون. يعني يعني بحس طبعاً في في أنا بحس طبعاً في انتماء إلى هذه الشجرة وانتماء إلى هذه الشجرة بطبعاً. من ضمن انتماء الى ارضي اللي هي فلسطين، ان شاء الله الله ما يهمنا منها. <تصفيق> ظاهرة عامة الجميع بعز الزتون وبحب الزتون خلص اتعودوا عليه. <تصفيق> يعني انس يعني امر طبيعي عندنا انه انسان فيش عنده زتون بيعتبروه انه انسان يعني فقير الحال، يعني <تصفيق> بجوز يكون معاه مصاري، يكون عنده سيارات، بس فيش عنده زتون بيعتبروه انه في عنده نقص معين. The Palestinian olive harvest, however, does not come without its problems. Every year during the harvest, Palestinian farmers face violent attacks from the Israeli occupation. In the next episode of our two-part series on the Palestinian olive harvest, we traveled to the Nablus district in the northern West Bank, where we met farmers who came face to face with violent Israeli settlers and were brutalized for simply trying to harvest their olives. الحجر أكثر من ستة خمسة ستة كيلو إن كان يضربوا فيه وأنا على الأرض. Okay, children, did you enjoy that video? Those enjoyed your video, just raise your hands. Great. So from that video, what we noticed is that how close olive trees are to the lives of the Palestinians. Some of these trees have been handed down from generation to generation. Some of the trees are as old, over a thousand years old. And in all, they are in excess of 10 million olive trees. Okay, we can move on. So these are some of the things that you would have seen.
and it is very, very important to the economy. Now, in the next few pictures, I'll show you some of the problems they face with the settlers and even the soldiers. So you can see in the first three pictures, uh, the trouble that the Palestinian farmers have during harvesting time. And then that's the apartheid wall that divides lots of these farms. So if a farmer has got say 10 hectares of land, they will they sometimes they come and build this wall in the middle of the farm. So the farmer does not have access to half his farm. So half the farm he cannot harvest and he can only work on half the farm or he needs a permit to get onto the other side and it's very, very difficult to get permits. So this is some of the, these are some of the hardships that they face. Okay, have a look at the next pictures. Now, these are the fences that they have built between the farms. So even the farmers, in order to go and do their harvesting, they need permission from the soldiers. Quite often it is not granted. And you can see at the bottom, the third picture, the person, the farmer is arguing with the soldier. The fourth picture you can see, imagine doing farming with the soldiers with their guns over your shoulders. This is the hassles that they have to go through. Okay, that brings us to the end of the second part. Now there's a very important third part and we'll conclude on this. And that is what is known as sumud. Sumud is a very, very important term in Palestinian, uh, the dictionary as well as in culture. So it means steadfastness. It refers to the resistance of the Palestinians to the takeover and settlement of Palestinian land by the Israeli occupiers. And Sumud also, the olive tree is a symbol of Sumud, of the Palestinians holding onto the land like a deeply rooted tree and preserving their identity. So you'll see the connection between the olive tree and Sumud. Okay, I'm going to show you a very interesting photograph that you probably have seen. Does anyone know who this woman is or what she is doing? Anyone? Yes, someone's hand is up in 4A. Come forward, please, my girl. Yes. Um, I, I think since the maybe maybe she's could be using the tree as protection or she's trying to avoid anybody cutting it down or taking it or taking her away from it. Wonderful. Excellent. So what happened here? If you go on to the next slide, I'll give you the history behind it. So this is an iconic picture that has become a primary symbol and sign of Sumud. It shows an elderly Palestinian woman in the village of Salem. And this is in West Bank who cries as she hugs an olive tree after settlers cut down the olive trees near Nablus in 2005. So you'll see this picture repeatedly. So whenever you see this picture, just remember that she's trying to hold on to the tree that they are cutting down. See, this is how deep rooted the olive trees are in the culture of the Palestinians. Okay, let's move on. So to describe what Sumud is, when the occupation uproots our olive trees, the Palestinians say, we plant many others. So on the picture there on the right hand side, that is the soldiers that are uprooting. Imagine the entire tree and thousands of trees are uprooted annually. When they demolish our homes, we reconstruct our homes. So the second picture there, you can see the lady, she's weeping. Her home is totally destroyed. Can you imagine the house in which you are living? You are given 15 minutes to evacuate the house and it is totally destroyed. All your belongings are lost. And then when they close our schools, we create makeshift schools. And I'll show you pictures of the damaged schools in the next slide. When they obscure our history, we engage in witnessing, remembering, so they write their history. And therefore, the importance of programs like this, where the history of the Palestinians is told repeatedly, so people don't forget about it. Now, in the next slide, this can you imagine this could have been your school? It has been totally destroyed. And here in that destruction, in that destroyed school, you can see the girl with her classmates behind her, they are busy with their schoolwork. And the picture on the left at the bottom, 
That's the school they have in the open, outside the destroyed schools. Can you imagine, children? This is the condition that the Palestinian kids have to go through daily. Now, these photographs were taken a while ago, but what's happening in Gaza at the moment, there's no schools, and even it is not safe to have classes like this because of the constant bombing. So friends, children, this brings us to the end of this lesson. The lesson was about the olive tree. Now you've got an idea of the importance of the olive tree in the lives of Palestinians. But the one word that I want you to take with you is sumud, steadfastness, perseverance of Palestinians. And now you know the link of the olive tree with the land and sumud. So I hope you have enjoyed this lesson, children. Uh, if you've got any questions, I'm not sure how many minutes we've got left, but if you've got any questions, we will take them now. Jazakallah khair, Brother Muhammad. That was a very informative and helpful uh, presentation. Jazakallah khair. So we just have a few minutes left, um, but the discussion can carry on. I encourage uh, the teachers in the room to continue the discussion and also all of those watching the recording to use the time that remains in your period to uh, discuss what Mr. Muhammad, Brother Muhammad has just shared with us. So I see a few hands up. We have time for maybe one or two questions on this uh, session, and then we'll close out. I'll go first to uh, 4A. Go ahead, 4A. I see a hand up there. Yes, I think Fatima. I know why uh, the the Britons chose e chose Egypt. I mean, so it's Palestine. But like, why cut down their olive trees? Not why not any other trees? Why specifically olives? Because okay, because olive olive trees, olive oil is very very important for the economy of Palestine. Fifteen one five percent of all the income that the Palestinians receive is for the olives, olive trees, olive oil, etc. And there's 100,000 families work on the olive plantations. It's very, very important. So one of the things that the occupiers want to do is they want to starve the Palestinians. They want to destroy their economy. And in order to destroy the economy, you destroy the trees. And it takes about 15 years for the olive tree to grow. So if you destroy the olive trees, then you're destroying the economy. That's the main reason, my girl. That's a very good question. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. So I think we'll take the rest of the classes in the class sessions. And Brother Muhammad, if you would just like to make uh, a closing dua for us, uh, for our Palestinian brothers and sisters, and then we'll we'll close out this session, inshallah. We'll do that, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala Ali Sayyidina Muhammadin wa barik wa sallim. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا عذاب النار. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to ease the burden of the Palestinians, to grant them success, to have a beautiful Ramadan that we are having. I know it's very very difficult, but Allah subhanahu wa taala should at least provide them with the food and the water and the essential things that they require. And Allah subhanahu wa taala must give the mujahideen total success. And I make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it possible for every one of us during our lifetime to visit Palestine over and over again. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ameen. Jazakallah khair. Thank you, everyone. Bi amanallah. Wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.